This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Friday, April 3rd, 2015, and I'm interviewing Mary Horse Chief Henderson for the Oklahoma Native Artist Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at OSU. We're at your home in Welling, Mary. You're Cherokee and Pawnee, and you come from a family of artists. Your mother's one of the early Cherokee women painters, and you have picked up painting as well as cultural items. You've won multiple awards at shows like the Trail of Tears and Cherokee National Holiday Show, and you've collaborated on paintings with your family while working full-time for Cherokee Nation Behavioral Health. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. All right. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Dallas, Texas, and I uh, actually grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. That's where we ended up. Uh, my my uh, parents, they met at Baycomb uh, back in the 50s, and they were part of that exodus to the big cities for jobs. And so my dad and his brother uh, took their families down to Dallas, and that's where they found jobs and were working. And uh, we came back, but my uncle remained down there. In fact, his family is still down there. So, um, yeah, so I grew up in Muskogee. We ended up there. I don't know, maybe it's the connection to Bacon. I don't know. But that's where we ended up. Where were you in the family in terms of brothers and sisters? I'm the second born, so I'm the second oldest. Um, my older brother Sam were two years apart. And my younger brothers are six years younger than me, six and seven, I think. So they were like the second batch. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad was a, a metalsmith, and I know you lost him fairly young, but do you have memories of him doing metal work at the house? Uh, no. My dad, uh, who told you he was a metalsmith? I thought your mom did. Oh. She, he worked with silver and oh, jewelry. He did some jewelry. He he wasn't okay. like a a metal smith jewelry right. type person. More uh, more like uh, findings okay. type. What what they would call now. Right. Um, he would make chokers and other types of necklaces like that. Um, uh, basically, he was he was just trying to uh, put some things together that would uh, help him make a little money and uh, you know give him something to do because uh, my dad was my dad was a pretty great person I mean I don't, I don't know how many people have told me that over the years um, he was a spectacular athlete him and my uncle Nat were uh, all staters at Pawnee wow. um, and he went to Bacon to uh, play football and basketball which he did and he was he would have been a coach he was he was going to school to be a coach um but uh he had he had issues with uh, alcohol really bad enough that it killed him you know uh he died of cirrhosis of the liver at a very young age he was 39 but uh yeah he tried and tried over a period of years to uh stop and there's a lot of different uh, ways of doing that over the years that people have used including arts and crafts and type things like that so that was one of the things I think that he picked up that he liked doing he would make uh, like I said he would make chokers and necklaces and things that uh, and sell them mm -hmm. and uh, I think I might even have one or two of those left I know my mom does but um, mainly he was he was just a like I said, a spectacular pe person that actually drew people to him. It's what it seemed like to me when people have come up and told me about him. A lot of crazy. I mean, I knew him because uh, you know I was a little older than Dan and them, but um, yeah, he was he was a he was a unique human being. I think. What are your memories of your mother working on art? Well, uh. I remember as a little kid her drawing and painting. Uh, uh, she would draw us and uh, paint us and use us as her figures in in her paintings. I remember my, some of my earliest memories are 
going to school with her at TU and uh, <laughs> I have a memory of walking under the uh, I must have been about three or four because I remember walking under the big wooden tables they had them big long wooden working tables in the mm -hmm. pottery mm -hmm. room and I remember walking under those tables and every now and then I would reach up and get something and look at it and I would put it back <laughs> Can you imagine having a three-year-old in the pottery room? Wow. Which is crazy. I, I don't know how old I was, but I imagine I was about that age. Because mom was in school uh, pretty much all the time when I was growing up. So, um, it, But I really liked it. I really liked going to uh, school with her. And they say that I was a really good kid, so it was no, it was no uh, burden, I think. And uh, we would have lunch together to this day. <laughs> Bean and bacon Campbell soup is my favorite because that's what we would take with us. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. Everybody thinks I'm crazy because it's so unhealthy. Vienna sausage sandwiches with mustard. <laughs> Not bologna, although I do like bologna. Not bologna, but it's because of that. Going uh, to school with my mom and what, so everything that I've, you know, so when I started doing it and picking things up and going to school and taking classes and picking up techniques and stuff, it was just, it was no big deal because this is what we do, you know. You'd been observing it. Yes, and I went to, uh, of course, there's all kinds of stories about art shows and things too. But, um, yeah. I, I've always remember uh, my mom painting and drawing and she did all of that while raising four children too. Okay. So, what was your relationship with your grandparents on either side? Um, I was very fortunate that I had uh, several uh, grandfathers on my Pawnee side. Um, I, t I, I try to look at it that way because um, on, my, on my mom's side, you know, my grandpa died when, uh, from World War II, uh, the mustard gas poisoning. Um, when she was really young and so I never knew him um, and so I had my grandmother <laughs> who is uh, she was uh, of English descent and uh, she was she was uh, she was something else she was she was from her own period of time believe me <gasps> and uh, had no interest in anything Native American had no interest in anything uh, artistic but she did teach me about uh, trees and flowers um, and we were very close because she bonded with me um, when I was a baby. I was the only one she bonded with. The rest of the boys never could understand why we were so close because uh, my grandmother was just so different, my white grandmother. Mm -hmm. My other grandmother, um, Uka, her name was Sophie Butler, um, her and my blood grandfather, Hugh Horsechief, had separated uh, by the time I knew them. And uh, he was uh, he was blind and uh, had gotten blinded from an accident. But he was a member of the Native American church and I just remember him always singing all the time. He just sang all the time. He'd sit in his room and shake his uh, sh uh, rattle and, and he would just sing all the time or he'd be listening to music all the time and I've heard that he did compose some some songs I don't know what those songs are but um, because of him I've always heard too that if we ever wanted to be participate more in the Native American church that that way has been made for us um, my grandmother on the other hand was a, a nurse at the IHS hospital in Pawnee and um, just visits with her I didn't get to spend a lot of time with her um, but, uh, uh, she would patiently answer our questions if we, every now and then we would ask her things. And we asked her about which band were we? And she always told us, uh, we we're all four because grandpa was two and she was two. And, uh, she never really talked about Pawnee stuff or anything like that so I don't know if it was because we didn't spend that much time with her or if she uh, um, 
you know, didn't think it was important, um, or from that generation, you know, that didn't think that those type of things were important. Um, so, but just being around her and being with her taught me more about being Pawnee than I think anything, you know, like that. Um, she did like to go to powwows a lot. And she, oh, she loved wrestling. She was an avid wrestler fan. And she would be watching it all the time. <laughs> 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 she loved wrestling. And, and she also was probably the one that taught me, first thing you do when somebody walks in the door, you ask them, did you eat? You know, and she always had brown beans on the stove. And she would cook, no matter what time of the day or night that we showed up at her house unannounced, it would be like, did you eat yet? And then she would commence to start cooking for us. And uh, that's how, you know, my dad grew up. So um, my grandpa's though, uh, Hugh Horse Chief was my blood grandpa. He used to call me braids because he would hold my braids. <laughs> and then he would... Uh, he would teach us a couple of words and he would always fan us off. He also taught me that. He would always fan us off every time we would come visit with uh, Cedar and, uh, and fans. And uh, he told me, uh, one time me and my cousin Ginger got scared because we thought there was a ghost in the house or something was bothering us. And he told us, he told me, and I don't know why, but I always remember it. And this is, this is something that I've passed on to people. Um, that you don't never have to be afraid. You know, that the Creator is always with you, and the Creator gave us these things to protect us with, and that um, if you if something's bothering you or you hear something, you tell them that they're not supposed to be here, and uh, you call on the power of the Creator to make them go away, and they will. And so I've used that in my life, and I've uh, talked to other people when they've gone through something similar like that. I said, well, that's what my grandpa always told me, and it's always worked for me, you know. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, a lot more to it than that, but, um, you know, he's the one that taught me how to fan somebody off, and um, I do that with my nieces and nephews. Um, I fan them off. I haven't done it in a little while, but, yeah, I used to do it every time before they would go back to school. Um, and talk to him a little bit about that. So growing up in this this kind of creative environment, what are some memories, early encounters with Native art that stand out for you? Hmm. Uh, well, like I, I was telling you, I went to school with my mom when I was in preschool to college. And I remember the smell. The smell of... Uh, you know, linseed oil and uh, oils and uh, what, you know, what an art room smells like, what a pottery studio smells like. I remember those smells and, and how wonderful I thought it was to have all of those supplies and things to just make stuff with. And the encouragement. I got a lot of really good encouragement, you know. So people, did you draw while you were there sometimes or yeah, make something yeah, hot or something? Yeah, I made a pinch pot at TU and they fired it for me and they were very encouraging. I've always had nothing but encouragement so I'm not, I know I have friends that are in families that are way more dis, I, mean, I shouldn't say more dysfunctional because we're pretty dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should say they never got any encouragement at all from their families. In fact they were pretty much told that's stupid, ugly, what are you doing? Or you can't do that. And so I've been very fortunate all my life. I was always encouraged by teachers, by other people, by other artists. So um, as far as art, so I, my very first memories are even going to Philbrook and running through that museum outside the, the gardens. Indian Annual? Yeah. During the show. In the gardens. Yeah. And I, to, I, to this day I still have a favorite room in there and a favorite painting. What is it? It's the Shepherdess. How cool. I love that painting. Yeah. <laughs> I think I know which one it is. <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. And the, the my favorite room is the, uh, oh, I don't know what they call it. It's the one with the glass floor. 
Right, it used it, to be a dancing to, room. Yeah, it, I love that room. And it, had, <laughs> and it had fountains. When I was a kid, the fountains actually worked. And it was just so wonderful. And it was it was on the other end of the museum, too. So they always had the annual at the other end. And, you know, all of the people and everything. So I could go over there and get some peace. Because <laughs> I always had to take care of the little ones. And, and oh, my God, the Williams, too. David Williams' kids, James and John, and uh, yeah, and and the others. Talk about <laughs> terrorizing Philbrook. Yes, we did. But you were <laughs> kind of in charge of the younger kids. Not well, no. No, there's okay. no way I was in charge. <laughs> there, there, you, you couldn't be in charge. There was, I mean, yeah, I was older, and maybe me and my brother Sam were kind of intended to be in charge but there's there's no being in charge of all of those kids it's they're just can you imagine <laughs> and then we would go back in there and steal cookies and um, punch and stuff you know because they would have the orders and things oh neat how about your um, art experiences in elementary school or middle school once again i was very fortunate uh i actually did go to head start because my mother taught head start <laughs> I did go to Head Start, so... And this was in Muskogee at that yes, point? Yes, yes. And uh, um, even like at uh, Franklin Elementary, I had an art teacher, Mrs. Boggs. And I found out when I was an adult that she was a relative, actually. And, oh, my first day of school. Actually, I went to Tony Getz. We lived on the east side when I was in first grade. And my very first day of school, I wasn't terrified. Like, you know, a lot of people say they have horrible experiences with their children the first day. But um, I remember going in a classroom and they gave us these big, beautiful manila pieces of big manila paper. Um, they were huge. On the, took up, they ran off the table. It was so big. And, uh, and these beautiful big crayons, you know, the big ones for little kids. They were beautiful, and uh, and she took us through the. She had had us draw the letter A, and then she took us through, and we had to put little eyes, and we made a little like a little Dutch girl with a little Dutch hat, and um, I was, of course, going to town. I was just thought this is the most <laughs> wonderful thing. <laughs> this is so wonderful. This paper and this, I just like materials, I guess. Anyway, um, I started shading and coloring and. You know, because uh, it was so much fun. And then uh, she comes over and she's walking along, you know, like teachers do, walking along the desks. And she comes over and looks at mine. And um, she didn't say anything. She she grabbed the paper and she jerked me up and she said, come with me. And I thought I was in trouble. And I was like, oh. But I, like I said, I wasn't one of those kids that was terrified and would cry and all that stuff I just went with her and I thought oh, what could I have done I didn't do nothing wrong and uh, I went with her and she took me to this other classroom and told this teacher she said look at this look at this and uh, I was like what did I do wrong so I'm sitting there looking at both of those teachers and neither one of them are saying anything to me they're just talking to each other and I'm standing there going uh, what's going on? And they basically were, I guess, amazed by the picture or whatever. And from that day forward, I got all the art supplies I wanted. I got all the paper. In fact, uh, I remember... <laughs> well, we changed schools. We went to, uh, like I said, we, we moved to the west side. We actually bought a house, a big house, and... Um, I went to Franklin and uh, we had an art teacher there and I always had, uh, they would move me to another table, I always had another table in some of the room that was bigger because they always had me doing all kind of projects. So they recognized your talent right away. Yeah. How, how about by the time you're in high school, have you sold any artwork yet? Are you entering any shows? That, yeah, by the time I got to high school, I already had one at Philbrook. Okay, so you entered the children's? Yeah, I entered the annual show. 
and I don't know if it was they I don't remember them having a student, a student show. Huh. They I might have had a division, I don't know. But I remember they had a purchase award and they bought my piece. Wow. So it's still there. And they hang it every now and then. How cool. Um and so you were what age? Well, it was about 75, so, because the piece was about 1976. It was about the bicentennial. Um. <laughs> so I would have been about 14, wow. 13 or 14, right. something like that. Wow. Which I thought was, when they said I won the purchase award, I was like, oh, what does that mean, money, you know? And they and they said that, well, what it means is they're going to buy your piece. And I go, oh, so that's all I get is they're just going to buy my piece. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I never really thought that much of it until I went to college. And um, that's when they were doing that uh, retrospective about their collection. Mm-hmm. And they were they were interviewing people and they were creating a book. And uh, I'd gotten interviewed and uh, told them the story about their work and everything and uh, um, told them about that and 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 they were going to show uh, some of the art. And I was in the I was included in the Bacon uh, bunch, even though when I did the piece I wasn't in school out there, but. Um, my professor, we had to do these visits when I was in uh, college. It was important to go to a museum and to uh, write a piece. And they gave us a day off to go do that. And w sometimes we would all go together. And so Professor R.C. Coons was with us and we we took a, a big, uh, I don't know if we, I don't know, somehow a bunch of us all went down there at the same time we were at Philbrook. And we were there to see the Thomas Moran exhibit. I mean, that was well, what I was going to write my piece on. And, um, was it Philbrook or Gilcrease? It was Philbrook. Okay, they had the Morans there. Yeah, this was in the 90s during this time. And uh, one of my friends comes running up and just screaming at me in the museum going, you didn't tell me you had a piece down here? And I was like, they have that up? You know, and I kind of knew that they were going to do it, but I didn't know when, Right. you know. And uh, Mr. Coons just happens to be right there. Of course, he hears it and he goes, you have a piece of Philbrick? And I go, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> he was just, you should have seen the shock on his face. He, and then he started smiling and he was just so excited. <laughs> and I was just like, and I, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to, when I was in school, the thing I wanted to do when I went back was I wanted to make straight A's. And you were at Northeastern at this yes. point. I was. I wanted to make straight A's because I wanted to get scholarships to finish. And the only way that I could bring my grade point up was to get as the best grade possible. So I had this system that I would use. And I was, I was, I mean, you know, I wouldn't suck up too much, but you know, there's things that you can do to make yourself appear more positive. So when an instructor is trying to decide whether you're going to be that, you know, point or so off or whatever, they're going to give it to you. Right. If you make the effort. And so that had been my mindset. <laughs> and so when he gets all excited, I'm going, I'm looking at him, I go, yes, yes, and we should go see it, you know. But you did get a little, a small check because they made a purchase award, right? They bought it from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what, what happened the first time that you went to college? Did you just get discouraged? Oh, uh, the first time I went to college, I was. Uh, well, let me see. Let me just say, um, I went early for one thing. I was only seventeen. Uh, and I thought I knew pretty much everything. I thought I had it all figured out. And I, and I went to OU for a year. And I enjoyed the art program there. I was totally lost. I remember being totally lost. But I had there were several older students that helped me out. Um, 
and that way of their their style at the time and the the style they were t even though I was taking basic classes was totally foreign to anything that I had ever experienced so I was just trying to make my way you know and explore it and um so it was pretty challenging actually but uh I I did a lot of partying up there and I and I missed by one credit so they put me on academic probation and I was playing softball I went up there to play softball and I didn't make the team I'm, I got the last cut I got cut and I I could have came back and probably made it but I didn't have the confidence to do that mm. um, I mean if I knew then what I know now or if I'd have had any more support that way, I probably would have. If my dad had been there, probably. He might have supported me, I don't know. Um, but I, I decided to leave there and go to Bay Cone and play ball there and go to school, which was the last place I wanted to go. And uh, Why? Well, it was back home. And at the time, I just wanted to leave there, you know. That's what a lot of kids do. They just want to get out of town. Get, a, get as far away as possible. <laughs> and so I felt like I had failed when I went back there. But uh, I, made, I made some good uh, friendships there. And uh, Who was teaching at the time? Dick West. Okay, wow. Dick West was there. He was back and um, teaching a couple of classes. Of course, Ruthie. And I think Janet Smith was doing an internship there, too. So I um, I got to take some classes under Dick West, <laughs> and I remembered him from my childhood because we used to sit in the back of the church at uh, Bacon, and we'd draw pictures on the programs, <laughs> and uh, basically not do a whole lot of listening, <laughs> but he would he had this deep voice, and <laughs> he couldn't whisper. <laughs> <laughs> but he was always so nice to us. He, Like I said, I never felt afraid around him. I never felt, like, uncomfortable. He was always so nice to us. And um, his hands, I swear to God, they were this big. One hand was about that big. About that big. But he would draw, and he would, and I would draw something, and then he would draw something. And God, I wished I had some of those. <laughs> Was he drawing on your drawing, kind of? You were drawing yeah, together? Yeah, we, oh, we would draw stuff together. That is great. That is great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you eventually finished your degree at Northeastern. Is that right? Is that where you got your... Yeah. A bachelor's in... Fine art. Okay. A uh, bachelor's in fine art with a, um, a minor in education and a minor in... Uh, Native American art, Native American studies. Okay. Yeah. Because I was going to do education. I was going to be a teacher. And I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> they got so mad at me when I said, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to finish my, I, I just know this isn't what I want to do. I just told them, I'm not going to finish my, I was this close too. I mean, all I had to do was get the, the last uh, internship. And... I said, I just know this is not what I want to do. And I know I should finish it, but is there something else? And they said, I, I had to have a minor mm -hmm. to graduate. And I said, I've got all kinds of hours in there. Isn't there something else? And then she, they started looking. They said, oh, yeah, the American Studies. You can take one class, and you're pretty much done it. Because I'd taken a lot of Native American classes over the years. So I have a minor in Native American Studies. Now, your mom had mentioned that she really hoped none of her children would turn out to be artists because she yes. knew how hard the path was. <laughs> yes, and we all got degrees in it. <laughs> Except for David, who didn't finish his degree. He's so close. Yeah, and I, I'm the same way now. I have become my mother. <laughs> you, you tell young people... Don't look at art as a full-time living. No. Or, okay. I, yeah, I do tell them that. I'm like, you know, 
uh, well, even when I was in school, you know, when I went back to school, I was an older student. And How old were you? 30s? Mid 30s? Uh, I was in my early 40s. I was in my early 40s, like 41, 42. But, you know, I was an older student, and uh, everybody thought I was so great. You know, they were, I'm like, you, you listen to the instructor, give you the instructions. You try your best to do what they say. You, you're, you're here to learn their technique. You're not here to do your own thing. If you're going to do your own thing, then just go out and do it. That's what so many art students have such a hard time with in co when they get to college and they're, because, I mean, you know, it's tough. You got to do what they say. And I, so that's what I would do. And I worked hard at it because I was really wanting those A's too, remember? Right. Uh, so they were just like, oh, Mary, you're so great. Oh, you do everything so wonder. You're going to, you're just so awesome you're such an awesome artist are you are you doing this now are you going to do this when you get out and i was just like <laughs> i would just look at them unfortunately it's so sad but i would just say you know what i'm a drop in the bucket i i can tell you right now i am a drop in the bucket yes probably if i devoted myself full time to this and actually worked and worked and worked i might actually produce something that might have an impact somewhere that doesn't mean I'm going to be able to make a living at it and I mean I was very real with them mm -hmm. if you're looking at trying to support your family that you're going to have because you will have one uh, you you better be looking at something and you're going to be doing this on the side if you are fortunate enough to pick up something, or if you're, if you don't think you're this fabulous, and you still really live and breathe art, and you want to do it, you better find something that you can do better than everybody else, like photography, the computer graphics, whatever, and then you could probably make a living at it, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you better be thinking about something else, and it's not a failure to be a teacher. It's not a failure to teach others and, and encourage, you know, people to uh, uh, learn and do as much as they can. There's, you know, it's not because you can't do art that you become a teacher. It's very, very tough. How did you end up getting into behavioral health? Well, when I, when I, uh, well, uh, I, like I told you, when I, when I was younger, I partied a lot. I, uh, and I, I developed, uh, an addiction to, uh, alcohol and drugs to the point where I didn't, uh, think I could do anything. I, I dropped out of school, you know, and I couldn't really, I, I couldn't hold a job. I was horrible at, uh, like Burger King and Arby's type of things. I wasn't, no matter how, much, how hard I tried, I just really couldn't do that very well. And it was difficult for me to uh, go to work, you know, uh, because of my addiction. So, and everything that goes with it. Um, so what I did was I got sober in Muskogee, went to Monarch, mm -hmm. and um, uh, started to... Uh, trying to figure out what I want to do with my life, you know, and I started working there. Actually, they hired me, and uh, I got recruited from there to go to this new treatment center called Jack Brown at the Cherokee Nation, and uh, by Richard Allen, <laughs> and Sam, and, and my husband, Jim Anderson, who was a counselor, going to be a counselor there. So that's when I came to Tahlequah. And that was in 1989, and um, I went to work at Jack Brown, and uh, at the treatment center there, I was a technician and worked with the kids. And I was there for about six months when I got recruited to go to uh, a new drug abuse prevention program, um, working with kids, and which I did. It was a grant. I did that, and I got, and I bounced from grant to grant to grant. Every every time. 
uh, one would end, another one would appear. So I've been very fortunate. I really haven't had to search for work, but I've been recruited. But every time they would recruit me, they would say, we're going to give you all this money. You know, this is what your salary is going to be. And I would tell them, I've got to go back to school. I don't have time to do all this. And, uh, and it was always these grants that had these massive amounts of things that they wanted you to do. <laughs> it was just crazy how much they wanted you to do. And they were like, you're the only one that can do it. And I'm like, well, um, okay. And then once I got in there, I wouldn't get the pay because I didn't have the degree. Mm -hmm. So this happened to me about three or four times. And finally, I just told them at the end of another grant, I said, I'm going back to school, you know. And so I did. And so I retired early and drew up my retirement and used that to go to school. It wasn't much, but I, I drew out some. And um, that was the mid-90s. So uh, when I came back, when I got out of school, <clears throat> I was going to go get my master's. I went and visited TU, OU, and Arkansas and applied to all of them. And actually, oh God, I loved OU. Remember Mary Jo Watson? Mm -hmm. she, took, she gave me a tour, and we had met before. Um, I, I had asked her to, or we were, uh, we were judges for some J.O.M. art show. That's how we'd met, and um, we, we would just get so excited about Indian art, you know. And she gave me the most wonderful tour there, and they had just got a collection in, too, that hadn't all been identified. And so I got to go through there and help identify some pieces and that weren't signed and um, talk about them. And that was kind of cool. And she really wanted me to go to school there. She even took me downstairs and I got to see the Pollocks. Oh, wow. God, it was awesome. <laughs> this big, giant uh, storage area. It was beautiful. And I really wanted to go. Um, but uh, I was married and I was going to have a baby and that wasn't going to happen. So I stayed here and I got a, I got a, I did get a raise, got a job. I became a customer service rep for the housing authority. And I did that for a little while until the housing authority kind of fell apart and started laying, laying people off and um, when they started laying people off I, went, I ended up being one of them you know you don't really need a customer service rep if you're going to lay people off so I asked a friend of mine who had been in uh, community work if uh, he still he always wanted me to come work for him and I said well you can't afford me <laughs> and uh, I said you know how you always want me to come work for you yeah, why don't we make that happen? <laughs> and so he did. His name was Marvin Jones. And he brought me back over to, uh, from Housing Authority to the Nation. And um, he put me in charge, or he put me over, uh, assigned me to the methamphetamine uh, program. It was, we were in the middle of a meth crisis. And we were trying to figure out what we, what we could do to eradicate meth in five years in the Cherokee Nation. And so that set, set me on the path with uh, the folks that I work with now. And that's when we started our community work, working with uh, communities to help them build uh, plans and training to uh, take a look at their local conditions and data and build strategies that attack those. So it's much more than brochures and posters. Mm -hmm. But um, if there's brochures and posters are still a part of it. But uh, yeah, and so I've been doing that for, God, it seems like forever. Um, and I'm going to continue to do it for a few more years and then, and then I'm going to do this. <laughs> Paint full time. I can't we'll, wait. We'll get we'll get to that in a minute. But um, does um, were you able to use your art skills, either painting or you know making cultural items? Were you using any of that when you were working in the counseling fields or 
Was that just something you were doing on the side as you could? Oh yeah, I've, I've been fortunate with that I've been able to do stuff uh, creatively with work for forever. I mean, when I was when the, when I got recruited, when when when, when I was at Jack Brown, um, I would work with the kids and do bead work and stuff with them too, and uh, a little bit of art therapy. I know enough about art therapy that uh, you know you have to be qualified to do it, but we would do a little bit of stuff. Um, and then when uh, these drug abuse prevention programs where I worked with these kids in the communities, we did a lot of art. So I've taught a lot of bead work. I've even, we, uh, at one point I was even at, uh, helping at Sequoia High School in the, in the dorms with some kids after school. Um, they had this thing called, a, God, what was it called? Where they would have an elder come in and work with them, and that was Betty Smith, who's a national treasure, and uh, I would do bead work with them. And uh, so now, in the prevention that I'm doing now, it's more of a science. Um, we're really, there's a lot of creativity that goes in with uh, developing strategies that's going to affect a local condition, like for instance, <laughs> We're developing a public information campaign for Cherokee County and for Wagner County. And our Cherokee County public information campaign, um, we've it's it's to address uh, binge drinking. Um, and we're uh, going to use Bigfoot as our spokesperson, like Smokey the Bear. Yeah, good idea. And uh, and there's a lot of materials that we've had to go through to try to develop um, the messages. You know, we know that a poster is not going to make somebody stop binge drinking. We know that. It's, but it's, a, it's just a little part of an overall plan, you know. With a bunch of strategies all together, maybe we can start affecting some change. And it takes a while. It takes, uh, sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes these changes can happen pretty quickly, like with policies and stuff. But, so we're coupling this with policy and enforcement and some other things, and so we're kind of excited about Bigfoot, and uh, we're going to throw in the NDUI program too, so um, there's always opportunities to make posters and uh, just to come up with ideas. Right, right. Now you taught a couple of moxin workshops, I thought, for the Heritage Center, or was it? I did. Okay. I, I, I did that with the Heritage Center, and then here lately I've been doing a lot of them with uh, cultural tourism, Cherokee mm -hmm. Nation mm -hmm. cultural tourism. What was the biggest challenge the first time you taught a workshop? Wow, the first time. I don't remember the first time. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing it so long. <laughs> Well, Are you able to use it to kind of advance your own work too? Or? It's it's pro the probably the biggest challenge is um, trying to meet people where they're at, you know, and then develop a way or a language or somehow to get them to the end point, you know. So I mean that's what teaching is all about is translating the material so that they get an understanding and actually get the end result that they want, hopefully. And, and, and I don't know, if, have you ever made a basket? Okay, well, you should make a basket. <laughs> yeah, you should make a turkey basket. <laughs> Next time you get a chance, you need to do that, because uh, that's, that's one of the examples I use. Most people that take my class have, have done that. Um, baskets is big around here. So, um, your first basket that you make doesn't usually turn out the way you envision it, you know, because it's hard to make mm -hmm. them, you know, symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be kind of, right. you know, there's things wrong with it. The first basket. <laughs> and uh, the next one you make, you correct some of that stuff. And the next one you correct, you know, and eventually if you work at it and you have enough interest or you like it even, you can probably make some pretty nice stuff, but it takes a little practice, you know, and uh, effort. And um, so 
I tell people when they take my class, I say, we're going to be working on this for about four hours, and normally everybody will maybe finish one moccasin. Mm -hmm. And not because everybody's slow, but because we're going to, we're going to learn the process, and then you're going to have this little bit of time to do it. And um, the hardest part is a lot of people take the class and they've never tied a knot before. You know, mm -hmm. and or threaded a needle. <laughs> so you know we have to go from from that. Or some people that actually make things, they will finish both of them. I usually have one in every class. Usually they'll finish two. Right yeah, there. that'll finish both of them. They may not fit them perfectly, that they might have to make adjustments to them. But um, I think of one time I. My friend made them actually. One of the last classes, I, she made, she finished both of them, and they fit her perfectly. They looked good. That's great. Yeah. The ones that do they fin? Do you think they finish the other one? A lot of the people who take your class, or do they? Just That's what they say they do. They say they do. Yeah, That's I great. run into people all the time. I run into people. All That's the great. Time. <laughs> I was at the casino the other night, and this girl just comes walking up to me. I didn't know. I didn't have any idea who she was, and she's like, "When are you going to have another class?" And I look at her and said, I said, I don't know, you know, I, it depends. And, and she, uh, she was saying that she really wanted to take it. And I was like, have you had one before? Have you made moccasins? And she goes, no, so we're really interested. And I was like, okay. So people recognize me. Or they know who I am because right. I'm slipping that card in the machine or something. And I'm like, <laughs> at there, I mean, I can understand that there. But I mean, I'll be at Walmart and people will come up and they go, when are you going to have another class? <laughs> so, I'm now that I have a little more time, I don't have a lot of time, but, um, you know, I'm not taking care of my husband, so um, I think I'm going to start scheduling some classes. It's difficult, uh, probably because it's expensive. You, you have to buy hides. Mm -hmm. And usually you want to have about 20 people. The more people you have, the more likely you're going to get a little bit of a profit. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to get a lot right. <laughs> for the amount of effort that you're putting in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, so you want to have about 20 people. That's pretty much max. And that's uh, ideally uh, 8 or 10 would be good. But I've gotten to where they, they just pack them in there now. One time I did 35, and I was just like, we can't do this anymore. You guys are killing me. That's too many. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not whining because it's hard on me. I'm whining because they're not getting the individual attention that they need. You know. Right. So I started developing a, I, I've got um, handouts that has instructions step by step. So I did that the first time. I one time I did a photographs that I taken at Smithsonian. I had to go up there visit my friend. Um, me you and didn't go on a fellowship, did you? <laughs> did you just go for a trip? Okay, great. We went on a work trip. Um, we went to the uh, every year I go to the Community Anti Drug Coalitions of America forum in D.C. And a few years ago, uh, my best friend, Lisa Trice Turtle, and I were going, and, she, and that was right after, maybe a year or so after, um, Dennis Zotai had uh, moved up there. And, you know, he had just finished the Oklahoma Historical Museum, and uh, so she said, we should call Dennis, and he can give us a pri private tour. I said, okay. So she set it up. She contacted him. She emailed him or whatever. And he says, yeah, you guys come on out. And so we jumped on the metro and the their subway train, whatever, and went all the way to the end in Suitland, Maryland. And uh, it was snow. There was snow on the ground, about a foot. And we got off at the end. Of course, we didn't know anything. Um, what I know now after going there several times, that they have main stations that you can get off and actually get a cab. <laughs> we didn't know. We were going all the way to the end, and we'll just walk. It's only a couple blocks, a couple of city blocks in foot-deep snow. 
yeah. is difficult. <laughs> <a> <laughs> we we did manage to get a cab after we started walking, and it was cars going everywhere too. And they were like, some a cab actually felt sorry for us and pulled up, said, "Y'all want to ride?" And we were like, "Yes." <laughs> it took us literally two blocks. And we were there. He says, are you sure this is where? I said, yeah, this is it. So it's a bunker where they store everything. It's their cultural, they, it was brand new then. They had a, they had brought the collections in because they had them stored everywhere, they said. Mm -hmm. So it's all temperature controlled. They had, they have these big uh, giant, giant shelves that move when you push a button. And they have drawers in them, just a whole bunch of them. And uh, he, he, they showed us the totem poles that, had, that were in Brooklyn. They've been stored in an old warehouse in Brooklyn. And that they brought them in, and the seal, seal jackets, and it was just wonderful. Mm. And uh, oh, and the, the repatriation room. Mm. And uh, you know, where tribes can come in and they can do what they need to do with the bundles and the... It was just so neat. And they were, uh... And the, um... Where they, the re where they restore things and clean things and all the equipment. And so, uh... And at the time they were cleaning, uh... Geronimo's, uh, robe. It was a robe that he had, which was kind of cool. And uh, and so he took me. He knew directly what we wanted to see. We wanted to see all the Cherokee stuff. And he said, "Then I'm gonna take you over. We're gonna see the pony stuff, you know, because he's pony too." And uh, I said, "Okay," but I wanted to see the moccasins. I wanted to see anything anyway. And he explained to us that they have uh, everything set up where you know known known enemies aren't like right next to each other. Their, That's cool. The artifacts, the things that they're, uh, so they'll be with, they've got everything set up that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's, a, you know, to create more of a peaceful environment too there. So it's not just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, temperature control and all that, but they, they really thought that stuff out and they let us touch everything. Uh, you know, I said, well, what? you need to give me some gloves or something, you know, and he said, you know, he said, this is our stuff. They said, this is, this is, so the attitude has changed even. Mm -hmm. This is, this is ours, you know, this is the people's. And so you're, what you're doing here is what we want people to come and look and examine. So. Were there any surprises with the Cherokee moccasins or the Pawnee? I, I, would, I didn't get to look a whole lot at the Pawnee stuff. They didn't have... Well, and they, I was surprised that they didn't have more. There were there were a lot of several jackets, you know, for the Cherokees, which were really cool. Um, several, several deer jackets, and uh, it was really cool to see the handmade buttons and the... Um, the the moccasins, uh, what I really liked about it was that they weren't all made the same way. You know, okay. they were obviously made by different people, of course. Everybody had their own way of kind of doing stuff. I, there, some of them were so stiff, you know, of course I couldn't turn them inside out or anything. And some of them had soles that were put on after. Mm. You know, which makes sense, you know, because they're not, they're, they're, Everybody that wears Cherokee moccasins, if they wear them for any reason for very long, they're going to have blowouts. Mm -hmm. If you wear Plains moccasins and you dance or whatever, you're going to have some blowouts. And so you, you could see the mending and you could see where they put another sole on one pair. And so that's what I really like about it. I felt more confident, um, you know, with the way I was taught how to do it um, is different from like Martha Berry and some other people. Um, you know, I had tried to do just the plain center seam moccasin. I, 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 had, I, I can do it, but uh, <laughs> for the Miss Cherokee that I did that for, 
I had to mend those about five mm -hmm. times because she kept blowing them out. And so what I discovered was the, the pucker toe, where you, where you gather mm -hmm. up the toe, is much more durable. And I've never had to mend them. I've never had to mend one of them. Wow. Of course, I, I'm pretty... Um, I make sure the knots and everything are pretty pretty durable. I mean, uh, if you don't do it right, of course they're going to blow out. But, um, yeah, the ones that, the, the center seam ones, they, they're not for, I don't think they're for everyday use. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was, that was, that was kind of cool. And then you can, you can kind of understand. Once I saw those, I could understand. So I'd like to go back and re-examine them. But, um, maybe someday. Mm -hmm. Well, you and your mom collaborated on a, I think, one of your first casino commissions, maybe. Um, can you talk oh, about... Oh, that was for the clinic. Yeah. Oh, the, for the clinic. I'm sorry. Can you talk about that collaboration a bit? Had you ever done a big painting with your mom? Like no, that? we had never done that before. Um, we, uh, it just kind of happened because, well, I don't know, really know. Uh, let me think about it. They had this call for art, and I wanted uh, I wanted my mom to be a part of it. For one thing, uh, the idea one of the ideas that I had had was uh, it was going to include one of our relatives in at the seminary, and uh, oh, a depiction of a yeah, turkey. And some of it had had a lot to do. With, oh yeah, it was our great great grandfather. John Thompson, the letters and all of that, and so, uh, and they were big, they were really big pieces, so, um, yeah, I just, when we were talking about it, I just told her, I said, we need, we need to all work together on this, that way we can get it done, otherwise we'll never get it done. Were they 8 by 12, or? God, I don't remember. They were huge. They are they were big, mm -hmm. really big. Mm-hmm. And so we did all work together. In fact, I think Daniel's the one that stretched them. And, uh, of course, we all gessoed them and stuff. And, and we worked on the designs. I think, uh, yeah, we all worked on the designs and the research and everything. We had a little bit longer to do that with. But they, they turned out really nice. Um, that, and that was the first time I'd ever worked in oil. Uh, wow. we, did, we did one in oil and one, a uh, couple of them in acrylic. And um, I look at that painting now, and I think, yeah, that person that did that in oil has, has, I it, I did it like I was painting in acrylic. Wow. So it's very brushy, and there's a lot of, um, <laughs> but that's where I was at at the time. <laughs> I like right. it. It's all right. Uh, you know, you never. It, I I personally never actually get to the point where I can do what I see up here. It just kind of develops and then it ends up being something. Now recently you answered a call, I think, and for the clinic at Stillwell. Is that what you told me? You ended up doing yeah. a piece. What, what did you do for them? The story of the strawberries. They called us last month and um, Elizabeth Toombs called us and said that they had already done a family collaboration with another family uh, at another clinic. And I think that was the Kingfisher family. Um, and would we be interested? And I th in fact, I think she called mom first, and mom told her that she needed to talk to me. So I talked to her. Because, <laughs> I mean, well, Daniel and I both have worked with Elizabeth, so we, we both know her and everything. But um, I, when she proposed it, I, and, but she said, we only got like a month. And, but the sizes, they were only 16 by 20s, mm. you know, so... They're not very big, and I said, "Oh yeah, that's no problem. We'll get it done." Yeah, we'd like to do it, and, um, and it just seemed like all hell broke loose after that. We <laughs> we had to go to Dallas one weekend. We were trying to. I, I was. Tr I wanted all of my brothers to be a part of this. You know, David doesn't paint, but I mean, my other brother Sam, and both of us work, and it's right in the middle of track season. He's a track coach, and it's just. So you took a canvas down there? Uh, no, to at Dallas that point or? we hadn't even met and talked oh, okay. about it. Okay, gotcha. We had, 
talked on the phone a couple of times, but we were all going to get together that weekend and, you know, work out some sketches and actually uh, communicate with each other on who was going to do what. <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't even done that. And we we were and then all of a sudden my uncle died and we had to go down to Dallas mm -hmm. and all of us went and um, uh, except for Sam Sam had to work and uh, Daniel drew out those sketches I told him I said just do it don't let's don't it, it's gonna take us forever if we wait mm -hmm. just do it and uh, so he was right in the back seat and he drew out those sketches in the when we were in that Dallas traffic. Oh my god, that horrible traffic. Wow. <laughs> and then we stopped and he showed them to me. I said, oh, those will work. Those will work, yeah. Let's do it. And then Mom said, I can fix canvases. I said, okay, we'll do that. When you get back, I said, when I get back to work, and I said, uh, I'll pick mine up sometime. That's when we also decided that we would all be working on separate canvases. And so... Uh, the last collaboration that we did, the big ones, we actually did all of us work on different pieces of each camp. I did have one, one that I did most of it on. I designed all of them, but um, the one that has the chunky player on it, <clears throat> I did almost all of that. Uh, and then, of course, we would just look at them and kind of... Uh, critique a little bit and try to try to make them better the that's the one that's actually it that is at the casino that we did do another c collaboration at the okay. casino at the hard rock at the hard rock yes daniel did the one with the turkey that's in a boardroom somewhere mm -hmm. and uh uh mom did mom helped with the the story of the first fire um she beaded the spider there's a spider about this big on in the middle of it and I did the design there's an owl flying because you know they sent owl said I'll go get it it was unsuccessful and uh, and then there's a big uh, there's a big medicine wheel in it one of those uh, uh, southeastern ones mm -hmm. and I think it's got some uh, Copper leaf. I was doing a lot of copper leaf at the time on it. Of course, the water. Daniel did the fish. And uh, I did the tree. But, yeah, we all worked on that. And would you each... You didn't work on site or anything. You were just like... Yeah, we did oh, all of that Oh, you did? Okay, site. that's what I was wondering. In my wondering. old studio. Oh, okay. Because we had room in there. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, we all did. I think Mom actually did take it, take that one canvas and beat on it first. So, you, your main focus, though, when you're painting now, it's pretty much acrylics when you get your choice of media. Is that no, right? Now it's oils. It's, oh. I love oils. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. I know. Great. I, I, um, I do like acrylics, and I like watercolor, too. Um, pastels. I mean... I kind of like a lot of different mediums. I, I guess it just kind of depends on what you're going to mm -hmm. say and do. I like acrylics because you can paint really fast. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because they dry fast and stuff. Uh, and, and for the style, like for instance, for that style that I did with the triptych, um, you know, you can paint really fast. It dries fast. It's going to give you the uh, the impact, you know. Um, the thing I don't like about them is I'm not I'm not getting a true color because it's always going to dry darker or different mm. for some reason, and that's what I love about oils right. is the color, the the trueness of the color and the shininess and the, all the different things you can do with it. Um, Daniel and Mom is the one that taught me into doing them. I use water based oils and uh, water based water mixable oil painting mediums and. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't do the old school stuff, but um, I really like them. Do you do preliminary sketching directly on your canvas, or do you do studies first and then? It depends. Um, ideally, yeah, I'd like to do it directly on the canvas. 
uh, if I'm going to do something really quickly, I can do that. If it's if it's a something that I'm, you know, pretty familiar with, I could do that. It hardly ever happens. Usually, um, I'm going to have to do some research and uh, some sketches and maybe even some uh, some little studies mm -hmm. that end up. I think they're a painting, but they end up just being a study for something else that's going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I I was taught by Dick West. Right. He he would take my <laughs> my sketches and just go, "This is too long. That's too short." And blah blah blah, and just start going all over it, just tearing the paper, just with his big old hands. I remember the first time he did that. I was just like. Wow, kid, go, kid gloves are off now. We're not in Sunday school no more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he handed it back to me. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm going to have to do this over, aren't I? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> so I was taught, you get that sketch and you get it right. And your, your, uh, your anatomy better be correct. You know, your, every, and I was taught... Uh, to know your history and don't be putting stuff in there if you don't know what it's about. For instance, design, decoration, and other things. Um, <laughs> the leaves on the strawberries. We looked at so many pictures. Um, not that we spent a lot of time with it, but mm -hmm. it. I mean, I was taught you make it correct because mm -hmm. somebody's going to see that and they're going to say, that's not right. You know, this is this is going. This is stuff that I mean. Wild strawberries. This stuff may collect dust and uh, you know, be in a storage room and you know get rained on or whatever. Or it might last for centuries. You don't know. More than likely, it's going to outlive you. So, you know, what are you going to leave behind? And it's important with uh, Native American art, I think. How about titles? How important are they? to you as a painter? I don't really care. <laughs> do you title your paintings? Or yes, you say? I title them. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't put a big emphasis on them. The, now the strawberries paintings, um, Daniel, I didn't even put a title on mine when I took it down there. Uh, Daniel had a title on his called uh, Strawberry Fields. And so, <laughs> <laughs> On my invoices, I put Strawberry Fields 2, Strawberry Fields 3. <laughs> <laughs> That's how committed I am to them. What's your creative process from the time that you get an idea? It can either be for painting or a design, beadwork design or whatever. Uh, you know, the best ones, they come in a dream. I think you're always thinking about them, or when I'm driving. Uh, but yeah, the best ones come in a dream usually. Uh, that one did. Mm. That one's about the ravages of uh, addiction. I think that's what it's called—is addiction. Um, I had that show. I I did my. Uh, oh, what do you call it? All art students have to do a show. I did yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, you're... All seniors have to do that. Your senior pro capstone project. Yes, my capstone. I did my capstone at, during the American Indian Symposium in the, oh. in the UC, in the, in the Morgan Room, or one of them, and I told them, I, I, uh, before that, everybody had always just done them down at the library. They set up some easels and threw some pictures up, had some punch. And I said, uh, man, if you're going to do a show, you need to have an audience and, <laughs> and, and make some sales. And so they didn't have a gallery back then. They got a gallery now downtown, which is wonderful, actually. And so um, I was, I, you know, I knew Phyllis Fife, and she, at the time she was over the symposium, and she was all for it, you know. She was like, "Yeah, let's do, let's do a show." And so I pretty much sold 
just about everything. But I had that one. I had that one up, and the reason I brought that up was because so many people and so many kids, you know, because a lot of schools bring kids through, you know, that uh, symposium. They'd all get up there, and uh, I got so many comments. I mean, some of them would just come in, and they were just like, "Yes, that's what it's like. Yes, yes," because so many. But you know, you just think about it. Everybody knows somebody that's been affected by alcohol, and uh, I, I think I got pretty close with this one, as mm -hmm. far as as far as what what it's like, and uh, people could relate to it. So. Right. And we're gonna look at that here in a moment. Yeah, it's a very powerful triptych. Um, so what has been a fork in the road in your art career where you sort of, in your art production, where you sort of went one way and you could have gone another? A kind of fork in the road moment. You might have mentioned it, but. Well, um. Like I said, I, I was all set to go to get my master's. <laughs> and uh, I didn't end up, well, I had, my baby was stillborn. And uh, so I don't have any children. I have seven nieces and nephews, but I don't have any children of my own. And um, I, I had to go through that as far as like what... Mm. Uh, the, the the process of grief and all of those things and uh, come out on the end and decide whether or not I wanted to go to school or if I wanted to start my life and my husband uh, was several years older than me and he really wanted to buy a house and uh, myself I was <laughs> I, I'm one of those people that didn't really care I mean I'm very grateful now that I have a house, um, you know, but at the time I was just like, I don't really care. But it was important to him, and I knew that um, I was getting these offers, and so I was going to be able to make the money that I'd always wanted. <laughs> it's my little cat. <laughs> She's decided to play. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I, I wanted, it was, you know, start my life, house or go to school and you know if I went to school how is it going to benefit me so what's been a really high point of your art production so far a high point oh but we were talking about the forks the forks yeah maybe we didn't finish that thought yeah I don't know if I even got to it uh you mentioned the three choices. Right. Yeah. The reason I didn't go to TU is because I couldn't get anybody to meet with me. I'd set up an appointment. I went over there and nobody was there. So I walked around the school and uh, saw what I really wanted to see was the graduate student areas. You know, what were you going to get for the amount of money? And, you know, normally they're just like little curtained off areas. Um, and... I didn't even see anything, and so the and the and the building was so small. I was like, they probably don't even have an area. So I left, and like I said, I had a wonderful tour at OU. She was really push. Mary Jo Watson was really pushing me more towards Indian art history, mm -hmm. but uh, and I really wanted to explore more painting, which you know would have could have anyway. Arkansas was awesome. <laughs> I've heard they had a good time. <laughs> and they had somebody meet me there. They gave me a tour, full out tour, and uh, they have a wonderful facility. They have a gallery right in their own art building. They have their own art library. And of course, you know, they have a lot of uh, funding. And they showed me, a, they actually showed me an area, a, 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 a little space about the size of this area right here, which was way bigger than any space that I'd seen before because usually it's like I'm talking small <laughs> and um, and they took me over to the financial aid building and offered me a scholarship that isn't advertised so I was going to get a full ride Wow. 
But, um, <laughs> and then I didn't go, of all things. So, you know, I don't know, that's been a long time ago, and I'm sure that some of that is probably still, I can go to school now, um, with my husband's, uh, VA, I could, I could do it if I wanted, so that's there too, as an option, if I ever wanted to, um, I'm just more interested in trying to learn more technique, mm -hmm. uh, actually, so I don't, I don't know that all of that is still out there as far as forks in the road. I'm very proud of my service to the Cherokee Nation as far as an employee working in the prevention field. I know it's important work, um, but I didn't get to do a lot of painting along the way. Mm -hmm. I did do some artwork and I have met a lot of people and you know, I got appointed to the National Treasures Committee. Um, I get, you know, people ask me questions like they think I know something. <laughs> <laughs> Hastings Shade told me that one time. He said, you know, one day he was talking about himself. You know, one day you're going to wake up and you realize people are asking you questions and they're referring to you as an elder and you don't even know you are. He says, and that's how, he said, and that's how I am now. And we were like, yeah, you're an elder. You know so many things, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm there yet, but it's kind of working that way. Mm -hmm. Um... But it's nice as far as, you know, being able to have some input on things. Right, right. So that's about as, as far as my fork, that's about as far as I've gotten okay. in the present time. But it could have been very different. Right. Well, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we take a look at your painting? No. What was that other question you asked before I took us off? Um, sort of a height, you know... I guess a high point in your art slash personal life and a high point and a low point if you wanted to um, think about that. Well, I think my high point's yet to come. Yeah, it sounds like you're really getting ready to... I think. Um, you know... I told you about Philbrook, and that was a high point that I didn't even realize was there. Right. Um, you know, I, the Creator probably has things in store for me, and I don't know what those are. He's always taking care of me. Um, I'll just do whatever I have to do. And I, uh, that's, that's one thing I've always thought of and considered. And Daniel, Daniel will say the same thing, you know. This, I'm just... I'm just riding on the train, you know, and uh, there was an elder, and I can't remember who it was, from another tribe, they were talking about to be the hollow bone, that's what you want to be, is the hollow bone, mm. you know, so that the, uh, and you have to keep it cleared out, you know, so that the creator can, can uh, move through you, you know, and out to the world. So, um, I just try to, try to do the best I can at that, you know, and, uh, wait for the opportunities and just try to be aware when they come, you know, to, uh, paint and do what I need to do. What, what he, what he feels like he wants me to do as far as what I need to say. Um, so like I said, I think, I think the best is yet to come. As far as my low point, you know, I had a lot of them when I was younger. Um, and this thing, you know, taking care of my husband because he got ALS from uh, Agent Orange, you know, being a Vietnam veteran. Um, some people may think that's a low point, you know, but he was, he was such a blessing to my life. Um, and to many other people, you know, uh, it was really just an honor. I wouldn't call it a low point. It was really extraordinary uh, experience. So I don't know. Uh, 
I'm hoping I don't have very many low points coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know you're not going to miss any calls. <laughs> any calls for art. Okay, we're going to pause it real quickly and reposition the camera to All take right. a look at your artwork. Okay, you want to tell us a little bit about your triptych? Yes, this is a triptych about addiction. And um, it, it, uh, this first one is really about uh, everything that goes with it as far as uh, living in an alcoholic family, uh, the consequences of it, and uh, uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, because children end up raising other children. Um, you know, you could even say maybe teen pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of it has to do with uh, how how uh, how we treat each other, even when mm -hmm. you're in that, mm -hmm. and how how uh, the consequences of it. Like I said, so the acting out and the high risk and the rage, mm -hmm. um, and then of course broken promises, um, good intentions but broken promises. And the COA stands for Children of Alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And on the can it says DUI, and uh, it's a it's a multi generational thing. That's why planting seeds is on there because uh, you know people grow up in this environment, they're more likely to unfortunately become the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, because and they they hear all this stuff growing up. You know, I hate you. Uh, you can't do anything right. Uh, you're stupid, you're not good enough. Those are, those are just, uh, don't cry. Right. Um, those are just uh, standard things. Okay, and this is the second part of the triptych. Yeah, so this is the second part of the triptych, and you can see that they kind of go together as far as flowing into one to another. Right. And that's, like I was saying a while ago, that's, the, as a result of all of this, a lot of times this is what you get from it. Um, this represents internalizing all of these things and the consequences of that. And so all of these things that are written into the figure is uh, what's internalized and what people think about themselves. Uh, if they grow up in this environment, um, a lot of times, children of alcoholics, uh, they have uh, shame. They feel like they're no good, um, even if you know they've been told that you're a great person or whatever, and you're doing wonderful things. Nothing's ever good enough, uh, and they're very angry. Right. Uh, and so some of this other stuff is what people say. I'm worried about you. They're just kind of standard things that come with it. Resentment, you know, why did this happen to me? Um, sometimes there'll be sexual assault. Uh, they'll grow up uh, with uh, all sorts of emotional issues from um, that kind of trauma. And the black part is very important uh, because people that are in that depression, that's what they say. All, all of them say it. Mm -hmm. All I could see was black. Mm -hmm. That's all I can see. And so the what this part right here represents the little white and the yellow is kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel. And they'll describe that too. They'll say, I can see a little bit of a light, but they don't really want to believe it. And they can't believe it. Because it has to do with the fear and the anger and not thinking they can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them do suicide. Uh, they disintegrate, they develop depression, and they isolate. And so that's why we've got this person sitting up here isolated. I can see why students would relate so strongly to this, too. All right, and this is the last one of the triptych. Yes, so you can see how it also flows into the other one, the last one. And what the last one represents is uh, recovery basically surviving so if a person makes it through 
um, all of this and they, they live and they don't commit suicide and they actually get some help um, and work through those things this is what can happen and these are some of the promises and some of the support and things that happen that you're not alone because you really feel like you are and what you realize when you get that support is that you're not alone they teach you how to be grateful that's part of the the changing in the thinking mm -hmm. because you 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 know you can think of the glass half empty or half full so they teach you uh, that you know about and part of that is about gratitude the easiest way to get to a positive thought is through gratitude and you got to think about it because uh, sometimes we like to dwell in our in our uh, feeling sorry for ourselves but that's also where the healing starts and being able to celebrate and feeling blessed and um, where the miracles start to happen and so the hand goes through from the person and it's holding like a little lamp and so that's like the yeah that's like the symbol of hope right. and the uh, butterfly, butterfly for a renewal cool well this one uh, I like it, and you know people like it because it's it does look like a cool blanket, right? It does. It would be um, a great design. It's actually a study, a color study um, that I did for school, <laughs> 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 and um, we were uh, we had it was a culmination of all of the the study about we had to do all these color wheels. Oh my God, we had to create. <laughs> I bet I created three or four different kinds of color wheels and then value charts um, and then we of course did still lives and some other things uh, to learn about color and it really opened my eyes to color and how many co like I can't look at that white wall without seeing all the colors in it Wow! as a result of all of that R.C. Coons taught me all of that because he's awesome that way He's a, he's a, uh, they honored him. He's one of the Millennium oh. uh, teachers for NSU. But he taught me all of that. And so what, what this is, is, is a study on um, complementary colors. So if you look, I mean, if you look at a medicine wheel, and I have one. You mess up your movie, but no, no, that's okay. Got a medicine wheel right here. Yep, go ahead and show that too. If you look at a medicine wheel, I mean a medicine wheel, color wheel, <laughs> a color wheel. <laughs> if you look at a color wheel, which is its own, I guess, medicine wheel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was working on me, believe me. You got your primary colors: your yellow, blue, and red. Those are primary. It's illustrated down here. You also have your secondaries which are in between those. So we've got green and purple and orange. Those are secondary, what they call secondary. And then there's tertiary, and that's the rest of them. Okay? Well, if you look at the wheel, and this is why I still have this wheel out here, because I haven't memorized all of them. I do kind of know them. What they call the primary color always has a uh, complementary color and so the primary color yellow the complementary color that is purple same thing with red the complementary is green you wouldn't think that but that's what that's mm -hmm. if you really want to bring out a color you add its complementary right next to it or and I did and I still do that when I paint if I want to mm -hmm. pull something out I add the complementary and that's how it is with and so it's directly opposite the wheel. That's why I got it out. Okay, so <laughs> great. what you got here, and I'm in the light, like here's a blue, and the complementary of blue is orange. Orange is right next to it. And it's kind of difficult to do <laughs> because you're putting lines down, right? And so right. I've got yellow and blue, I've got red and green, and there's different values here, but there we've got the purple and the yellow and the red and the green again and the red and the green and then there's orange which is also kind of a a really warm color and so these these are all right next to each other 
And it, you know, just the uh, softness of the lines, and you know, it. And it I looks did like it, Yeah, I did it piece really of fabric. brushy. It looks like a blanket. I did it really brushy, and mm -hmm. I was. Uh, we were ideally we were supposed to make those lines really straight mm -hmm. and perfect. Oh, it looks. And <laughs> I didn't do that because I <laughs> wanted to do it really fast. And um, I didn't make them straight and perfect because I can't do a straight line. This is one of my <laughs> one of my fallacies. <laughs> I cannot paint a straight. It's very hard. My mom's real good at it. I can't do it. But it works so much better like this. Actually. So that's you why that I didn't do it. But Mr. Kane said it's fine because you did the whole thing that way. If you try right. to make some of it straight and then it would wouldn't work he said but you <laughs> he came and looked at it and he goes I said I'm finished he came and looked at it and he goes okay I said I'm done you're not gonna make me redo anything because I <laughs> thought he was gonna to and everybody just looked at him like <laughs> once again just, she didn't follow yes. directions <laughs> yes. uh, that's great teacher's pit <laughs> But he was right, and I love this painting uh, because of that. I've got the memories, but also because it's such a cool painting, and I want to do it bigger. Right, right. That would be neat. And it does look like a blanket. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Mary. You're welcome. <laughs>